Good morning, everyone. I'm Nick Molo, the Executive Director of the Aldersgate Group and your chair for today's uh, event. I'd like to welcome you to the launch of Wilmot Dixon's Sustainability Strategy for 2030, Now or Never. We'll uh, begin the event in about a minute's time with an opening film. Uh, we are just uh, giving people the opportunity to all join uh, online. We're expecting more than 2,000 people to join us uh, today, so we want to give people enough time to be able to log on uh, properly. These things always take a bit of time, but stay with us. We will begin in about a minute's time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sophie. I could be your daughter or your sister. I'm 21. Growing up, I've seen trees and wildlife cut down. I've seen wildfires devastate landscapes, sea life killed and maimed by the pollution in our oceans, families displaced from their homes by flood and drought, and loss of life from pandemics. As far as I can see, things are getting worse, not better. Plants and animals are disappearing faster than ever. We're using our natural resources as if they're gonna last forever and pumping out more and more carbon, accelerating climate change. And even now, in our modern society, we still have poverty, hunger, racism, slavery, and there are so many children in desperate need of our help. So many people my age are disadvantaged and our life chances shouldn't be determined by where we grow up. We've been talking about saving the planet since before I was born. So little has changed and now I'm worried time's running out. What would I like to see by 2030? I'll be 31 by then. I'd like a nice home, a family. I'd like to work for a company that cares about doing the right thing. But most importantly, I want to live in a world which respects our planet and where everyone has a positive future. I want to look back in 10 years time and say thank you to everyone who has acted now. I want to be able to thank everyone who helped restore and protect our environment, who helped reduce our carbon emissions and who used our precious resources wisely and who built sustainable and fairer communities. I want a future where we look after each other and understand the value of our communities so we can help those facing their greatest barriers. I don't want empty words about being environmentally friendly. I want people to keep their promises and to act on them. By 2030, I want to be able to look back and be proud of the difference that you've made. Look, we think Sophie's right. Sustainability cannot be an add-on anymore. It must be a priority for us all. At Wilmot Dixon, we want sustainability to be at the heart of everything we do. We have a moral duty to go further, to play our part in creating a better planet for future generations, to shape a fairer society that is prepared for the challenges ahead, to create brilliant buildings as standard that are net zero carbon in operation and are ready for our changing climate. We are committing now to change the way that we and our industry work over the next 10 years. Brilliant buildings, building lives, better planet. Together, we will make a difference. It's now or never. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the launch of Now or Never. Wilmot Dixon's Sustainability Strategy for 2030. I'm Nick Molo, the Executive Director of the Aldersgate Group, of which Wilmot Dixon is a long-standing and very active member. And I'll be your chairman for today's event. Now, we have a very exciting and packed agenda for you for the hour ahead. In a moment, we will hear from Wilmot Dixon's Group Chief Executive, Rick Wilmot, to give you a bit more of a sense of today's sustainability strategy. We'll then hand over to the group sustainability team to give you an in-depth overview of the three core pillars that underpin today's strategy around brilliant buildings, better lives and better planet. I will then be joined by a distinguished panel to reflect on some of the key issues that will be discussed in today's strategy. 
Now, I would like to welcome, first of all, the author, broadcaster, and commentator, Jonathan Porritt. Hello, Jonathan. Wilmer Dixon's uh, Chief Sustainability Officer, Julia Barrett. Good morning, Julia. Hi. And the Managing Director for London and South, Richard Forsdyke. Hello, Roger. Hello. We will then uh, move to a Q&A session and we will do our best to go through as many questions as we can during that, uh, during that session. And I would like to encourage you to submit as many questions as you can throughout the event so we can have a good pool of questions to draw from. And if we are not able to go through all your questions at today's event, given that we've got quite a packed agenda, we will endeavor to respond to all questions in writing following the event. And I'll be saying a bit more about that at the end so that you know where to find the answers. So without further ado, let's now hear from Wilmot Dixon's Group Chief Executive, Rick Wilmot. I'm absolutely sure that our people understand what's going on in the world. The science tells us what we now need to know, which is we are facing a global climatic crisis. We have, as a planet, 10 years to halt the increase in temperature globally. It has to be a group-wide commitment, otherwise we're going to fall short, which means that everybody has to play their part to give us a chance of having a planet that's going to be worthy of, uh, of handing down to the next generation. Social inequality is, alongside climate change uh, is one of the, the major features of, of how we intend to interact with the communities in which you work over the next 10 years. With the focus and locality of, of our people, the opportunity of interacting with social enterprise locally, either for training or for education, just gives us a, a great local presence and to, to feed on the passion of our people who, after all, are employed locally. It's been said many times over the last couple of decades that you know, we have a purpose beyond profit. If we're going to continue with that focus and that commitment, then we need to expand how we contemplate and deal with um, our responsibility in relation to sustainability and the environment. We're launching a new 10-year sustainable development strategy today, of which I'm hugely proud. It goes far beyond anything we might have contemplated seven or eight years ago, and is certainly industry-leading. And the three key themes that uh, form part of this strategy, brilliant buildings, building lives, and better planet. The biggest issue for the construction industry is that if you just look at it in its simplest form, in terms of environmental impacts, a high-impact industry, but the great thing, and the thing that I think gives us most hope, is that because it is a high impact sector, small changes do make a material difference. And those are the things we focused on in our first 10 years. Our second 10 year plan is going to make a step change in terms of how we address that. I'm incredibly proud of the effort, input, uh, and also the output of uh, one of our, what our people and our company has achieved. It's quite extraordinary the fact that we've it had a radical impact on over 10,000 young lives already, a year ahead of target, with the full buy-in and support of our people. It's been, it's been extraordinary. When I sort of drill down and, and look at the things that don't go right in the built environment, the primary problem is that we as an industry build buildings that don't perform as designed. Our future plan will see a real intent, a growing expertise in ensuring that the buildings we build are mapped and matched to a customer's expectations and therefore the performance gap of that building will be narrowed or beaten. If every individual in our organisation, if every member of our supply chain, if every customer gets on board then at least we're doing what we possibly can. We can influence hugely the, the output and the resource consumption of that entire supply chain and that's tens of thousands of people that can do a better job. The exciting thing is that it's going to transform the way that we work. Uh, I see the whole sustainability theme as something that makes us a better business in a way that others are going to find it really difficult to match, which therefore means hopefully we'll become a more attractive business to our customer base, to our supply chain and to people who want to work with us. It's a refresh of the organisation it's a chance to build on those strong foundations that we've had for almost two centuries and you know, be a leading light in the, in the future. 
it's clear listening to Rick uh, uh, just now that Wilmer Dixon with today's strategy is genuinely committed to delivering transformational social and environmental uh, outcomes. And I think it's also clear from the two opening videos that we've been uh, listening to that the company doesn't see today's sustainability strategy as, a, as an add-on to its business plan, but rather as an integral part of it. So before we go to our panel for their reflections and we also go to your live questions, it's only right that we hear a bit more about the three core pillars that underpin today's strategy and that we get a better sense of the targets and commitments that Wilmot Dixon is setting itself for the next 10 years, but also importantly, how Wilmot Dixon will go about delivering them and how will it engage its supply chain in getting there. So we'll now move over to the group sustainability team for a presentation to give us a bit more of a sense of those three pillars. And I think we will start with uh, you, Michael. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Cross. My colleagues and I are gonna take you through our new sustainable development strategy, now or never. Looking back, our world has changed dramatically in 2020. What we thought we knew at the beginning of the year it's been turned on its head. The future is more unpredictable than ever. But one thing we do know with certainty is that we all face some very big challenges over the next decade. Now or Never is our roadmap for how we tackle these challenges, provide our customers with the solutions they sorely need and secure our ability to operate and grow in the future. The film we shared with you at the beginning of this session and the message from Rick emphasised the destruction of nature at a rate that we've never seen before. The widening gap between rich and poor in our society and the very real threat of catastrophic climate change. The science tells us that what we do in the next few years will profoundly affect the next few thousand. Never have we had so much to do in 10 years. And it's easy to become numb to the images we see on TV, or feel that these challenges are too big or remote for us to influence. But these are our challenges. And the consequences of just continuing with business as usual are significant. There will be wide ranging impacts on the ability of all our businesses to operate, but also on all of us as individuals. We know this, our customers know this, their communities know this. And so what they expect and need from us is changing and rightly so. The next 10 years is also an opportunity to change our industry and put sustainability front and center of how we work and what we deliver. So we really believe this is a decisive decade for us, but also for you. And that's why this strategy is so important. It sets us apart. It commits us to move faster and go further, to innovate and to lead. It's not just a wish list. It represents two years of listening and collaborating. We've worked with people from across from Walt Dixon, but also with customers, supply chain partners, NGOs, industry peers and experts. A lot of you listening today were involved in that process. Thank you for all the help you've given us. Your contribution has been really important. It's meant we've been able to build an industry leading strategy that is anchored in delivering value for our partners, their communities and our people. It also means that now and ever has been born out of collective endeavor. And that's really important because that's exactly what we need to draw on in order to deliver it. So the strategy itself is made up of two parts. Our themes, which lay out our long-term ambitions and targets. In simple terms, these are the outcomes that we're driving toward. And our enablers, they're at the heart of how we do business. They reflect our values, they guide the decisions we make and the way we behave. But most importantly, the enablers show how the collective efforts of all our people, our partners and our customers align to deliver our 2030 ambitions. Today, we're going to focus on the themes and what they represent. So I'll hand you over to Alistair to tell you a bit more. 
and hello everyone. I'm Alistair Dalton, and I'd like to talk to you about brilliant buildings. The buildings we're delivering for our customers today are already brilliant in lots of ways. Really well designed, high quality, excellent value, and with great customer relationships. The new strategy is about all of us taking that crucial next step. The overall aim of Brilliant Buildings is to construct and refurbish buildings fit for current and future generations in terms of the energy they use, their carbon emissions, their resilience to hotter and wetter future climates, and how healthy and comfortable the people living, working, teaching and learning in our buildings will be. That climate crisis that we all face makes it critical that in future we create brilliant buildings that are also truly sustainable for our customers, our communities, our supply chain and ourselves. The Brilliant Buildings theme has four key ambitions. By the end of 2030, all our new buildings and major refurbishments will achieve net zero operational carbon. And they will also be future climate ready and optimize the health and well being of people living and working in them. We want to achieve this on projects where we can collaborate effectively with our customers to get there, essentially on projects where we have design responsibility at an early rebus stage. By the end of 2040, all our buildings and major refurbishments will be delivered with net zero embodied carbon and our supply chain will achieve net zero operational carbon. Now these two ambitions set us really challenging goals to reduce the impact of all of our construction materials and supply chain processes. And that's why we're starting on that journey now. You can see that achieving net zero carbon on our projects and processes is at the core of three of our ambitions. So let's look at what that means. Achieving net zero carbon for our buildings is all about balance. We have to make sure we can balance the energy used to run the building with renewable energy supplied from the building itself on site or from off-site sources via the grid. And the result of that balance is a net zero emission of carbon. So that means for a net zero project we build for our customers, there are no further carbon emissions as a result of delivering that building and the customer using it. So what does that mean for our project teams when we design and build a net zero carbon building? Step one is about reducing energy usage from all the heating, lighting and other equipment in the building. And that's crucial for two reasons. Reduced energy use means reduced energy customer energy bills and it means less energy to supply from renewable sources to make that balance. Delivering more projects to low energy building standards like Passive House will be a key focus for us here. Step two means a studied carbon associated with all the concrete, steel, cladding and other materials in our buildings and using new digital tools across the business to evaluate and reduce that embodied carbon with alternative designs, materials or processes. Step three, on-site renewable energy generation is possible with the rest from renewable grid sources. And we will offer customers a new capital cost free route to on-site solar energy from community partners on all our projects. The last and vital fourth step in the net zero carbon pathway is to measure and verify both the energy usage and the energy supply once the building is in use to make sure that our design intent matches with how the building really performs. Our proven energy synergy process will become our standard way of ensuring that net zero as designed and built by Wilmot Dixon is verified as net zero in reality. So while meeting our three net zero carbon ambitions is really important for our customers and the planet, our fourth brilliant building ambition is a key goal that we have to achieve at the same time. We can't just create buildings that are brilliant in carbon emission terms. They also have to be designed for future changes to a hotter and wetter climate and be great places for people to use. 
So our strategy is to create future design standards for projects and standardized product and platform offers that prevent future overheating in the homes, offices and schools that we build, make projects resilient to flooding and weather impacts, and achieve the best possible outcomes for the health and well-being of people living, working and learning in our buildings. Where a comfortable, well-ventilated and productive environment is what everyone expects and what everyone is experiences. The challenge now for our business is working with our customers and our supply chain partners to achieve these brilliant buildings ambitions within those timescales and for all comfortable, well-ventilated and for everyone all of our projects. That wraps up Brilliant Buildings, and I'd now like to hand you over to Sarah to talk about our next key theme. Thanks, Alistair. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Fraser. Building Lives focuses on the social impact we have on the people, businesses and communities we work with and for. We have an overall aim and three ambitions for the next 10 years. Our overall aim is simply to support the people and businesses in our communities to thrive. We want to leave a legacy that reaches beyond the walls of our buildings and lasts way after the hoardings have gone down. I'm really proud of what we've achieved already, but now we need to strive forward, not just because it's the right thing to do, because it helps our business. If, and if we work together, it will help those of you in our supply chain or customer base too, because all of us are under increasing societal and legal pressure and we all share decreasing budgets. So let's have a look at how we can increase impact on communities, business and people. Communities across the country continue to face unique Indicators of life satisfaction, happiness and anxiety all got worse last year. And that's before the challenges of 2020. Understanding our communities is critical. We need to redefine who is the community because it isn't just those people out there. It's all of us made up of our employees, customers, competitors, supply chain, and it's both individuals and businesses. What do they need? True social impact only happens when our solution addresses a real need. So let's be really clear what that is. And finally, let's be brave and transparent about what impact we've actually had so we can learn and improve. This three step process is logical and deceivingly simple to understand, but something that's really difficult to achieve. And it's not something any of us are doing really well at the moment. So what will be different? Our people will not only listen to what our customers want, but share with them our views on the challenges in their communities and work with them and other partners to work out what we can do about it together. This will make our conversations different and why our first ambition is to deliver high impact social value that we can demonstrate meets the needs of local communities where we work. Business. Wilmot Dixon must completely secure purpose at the heart of our business while supporting other businesses to prosper. You may be part of the businesses we support because they will be in our supply chain and our customers, as well as social enterprises or charities. We believe that to support any business enables us to be part of something bigger than if we just focus on individuals alone. We want to drop a stone in a pond and watch the impact spread like ripples. We will share our expertise and give other businesses access to our training because we believe sharing knowledge and supporting others to succeed is key in the role of a leader. We do remember that Wilmot Dixon isn't perfect though and we need to constantly learn and improve too. So we will challenge ourselves to make social value a consideration in every decision we make from how we support our own people to what we procure. It will be a challenge for each and every one of us because our second ambition is to make sure that how we do business will set the standard for social value in our sector. People. The UK 
continues to have one of the highest levels of income inequality in the world. Did you know that 30% of our under 16 year olds are still living in poverty? This is just unacceptable. Over the last decade, we've worked hard to do our bit to make a difference. And we have, we've enhanced the life chances of over 10,000 young people. But over the next decade, we need to increase our reach. Young people are still important to us, but we won't only focus on them. If our communities say we can make a bigger difference to the long-term unemployed or newly released from prisons, we'll do that. We maintain that one of the best ways to improve inequality is to ensure that anybody can have access to good quality work, something that's more important now than ever. This will be where we focus as for our third ambition, we commit to supporting people who face significant barriers to be in or on the path to good careers. Now, all of our ambitions have targets and measures and whilst I haven't gone into detail on all of them, what's really exciting about our career target is the transparency we've given to reflect the different activities that have different impact. Hence, we'll connect with large numbers of people, for example, helping them with one-off training or their CVs. But we'll also have a transformational impact on a much smaller number right at the centre of our target by supporting them with careers. Some of those will be directly with Wilmot Dixon. These will be the people who wouldn't usually have had this opportunity and it will be their stories that set us apart. It will be these people who add a new diversity to our business, challenge our thinking and help us grow. Unsurprisingly, how we are going to do this has had to change. In October, we are launching the first of five Building Lives programmes aimed at supporting people into work. These programmes enable us to deliver social value in a socially distanced, fully digital or traditional way. They will enable us to harness the efficiencies of using digital platforms and a national approach. And I look forward to sharing more information on this soon. Because whilst I could go on, our responsibility goes beyond creating brilliant buildings and building lives. We also have to leave a better planet. So I will hand over to Cathy. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning. My name's Cathy Myatt, and I'm going to take you through the Better Planet theme. So far this morning, you've heard Alistair talking about our buildings and Sarah about our communities. But this theme is much more about us in Wilmot Dixon and what we are doing. It's about how we construct our projects. Personally, I can't help but be affected by the scale of the environmental challenges we face and that it's our generation that's tasked with responding. But this theme is where we can show leadership we can show you, our customers, how seriously we take this. And for those of you in our supply chain, we'll aim to provide clarity and support so we can all do better. Our overall aim for this theme is for our projects to leave the environment in a better state than when we found it. Our first ambition is to be a zero carbon company without any offsetting. We're currently reliant on fossil fuels to carry out our work, whether that's the diesel in our cars or our generators or the gas we use to heat our offices. And the carbon that's released is contributing to climate change. We've done well over the last 10 years. We've doubled our turnover without increasing emissions and we've funded offset projects overseas. So we've been carbon neutral. But the scale and the urgency of the climate crisis means it's not enough. So by 2030, we will completely break our reliance on fossil fuels. This will place us as a leader. We will reduce our own carbon emissions to zero using only renewable sources for all of our energy and become a truly zero carbon company. Our second ambition is to generate zero avoidable waste. As a society, it's become normal for us to buy new products and then just throw them away when they're no longer needed. And the construction sector is guilty of this. The continual need for more resource and the accumulation of waste is damaging our planet. It just needs to become unacceptable for us to produce waste. To achieve this, 
We will understand at every stage of our projects where our waste is produced and then find ways to prevent it, to avoid it becoming a waste. When we do have surplus materials, we'll focus on how they can be reused or if not recycled into new products. And if we do all that properly, we should be left with only a tiny proportion of waste that's unavoidable. That is how we'll achieve zero avoidable waste. Our next ambitions relate to the natural environment. We know that having access to nature can improve well-being, and green spaces do so much more than that, playing a role in helping reduce flooding and improving air quality. But pressure on the environment is growing, especially in more urban areas. We're seeing species decline, more flooding, air quality in our cities affecting school children and water restrictions in the summer. We want to reverse that trend. By 2030, it's our ambition for our projects to leave the natural environment in a better state than when we found it, to deliver an environmental net gain. We want to capture the benefits for you, our customers, delivering buildings that bring people close to nature with more wildlife and improving the local environment. And finally, our fourth ambition is to halve the volume of water we use during construction. But how do we deliver all that? A lot of the what's in the Better Planet theme should be familiar to you. We've been working on this for a while and we've got good foundations. So you might ask what's different now or what are you changing? Well, for our projects, we'll adopt a new efficient site, site setup on every project with a new cabin standard. And we'll design our sites to be 100% electric by finding ways to cut diesel use to zero. For waste, we'll need you in our supply chain to work with us to use material management plans to find a reuse for all our surplus soils, to really look at design, at how we select and buy our materials, and at how we protect our buildings from damage, and how we can stop packaging waste. And we'd like to work with you, our customers, to look for opportunities to build in nature, like green roofs or sustainable drainage schemes. And we'll look beyond our project boundaries. We will find trusted partners who can help us deliver an additional 100,000 trees involving local communities in improving their own local environments. But this theme also cuts across all our offices and workplaces it really does touch all of us. We'll just stop buying single-use plastic and we'll focus on making the right choices about how we all travel for work. We'll need this to meet our 2030 targets of a 65% mileage reduction and a fully electric fleet. That's how we'll start on our journey to reach our ambitions and it wraps up the Better Planet theme. I'm going to hand you back to Mike to tell you what's next. Thanks, Cathy. Now, I'm conscious that we've given you an awful lot of information in a short space of time, and we don't expect you to remember it all. But there are some key messages that we really want you to take away from today. Number one, the challenges are big, but so are the opportunities. Now or Never is about us doing the right thing as a purpose-driven business, but it also differentiates us it gives us the ability to meet the needs of our customers in the best way possible. We really believe there's value for everyone in the outcomes we're committing to. Number two, there are no easy options here. Delivering our ambitions will change how we work and what we deliver. We don't have all the answers yet and we won't always get things right first time, but that's okay, that's the nature of change. As long as we truly understand the problems and we work together with all our partners, we will find the solutions we need. And lastly, and I think most importantly, we need to move fast. The clock is ticking. The launch of Now and Ever is just the beginning and we know we must follow up, but we can only go so far by ourselves. So if you want to build, build brilliant buildings, create, support the communities where you work, 
and leave the environment in a better state than when you found it. Come and talk to us. Let's work together and deliver the change we want. We all have a part to play. So we're coming to the end of this presentation now. And there's been a lot of talk and, and some of you may be wondering, well, what happens next? Well, a full strategy document along with the short films that you saw today are now available on our website. Tomorrow, we'll be sending all of you a link to both the films and the document along with access to a recording of the webinar if you wish to watch it again or share it further. We'll also be running a series of online events covering more detail on each of the themes throughout the rest of this year. And if you'd like to discuss any of what you've heard today in more detail, please get in touch with your contacts at Wilma Dixon or drop us a line via the email address on your screen. But I have no doubt that our local customer and supply chain teams will be following up with you very soon. So I think that all that remains to be said is thank you for listening. This is a great opportunity and we look forward to working with you all to deliver it. I'll pass you back to Nick. Thank you very much, uh, Group Sustainability Team, for this excellent presentation. I think you've done a great job of bringing this very comprehensive uh, strategy to life and giving us a bit more of a sense of the uh, key targets that sit uh, below the objective of brilliant buildings, building lives and better planet. Um, I was particularly struck by the overall commitment to create great buildings that are ready to adapt to a rapidly changing climate that are net zero carbon in operation, but which also provide places for people, businesses and communities to, to thrive. And I think that holistic uh, take sets a very important precedent for, for, for the sector. Um, it's now time to reflect uh, on what we've been hearing. And I'd like to ask our panel to come uh, online, as it were. So, uh, Jonathan, I'd like to, st uh, to start with you. Uh, you've had you've played a very important role in uh, the last few years in helping shape Wilma Dixon's thinking and positioning on, on sustainability. What do you make of today's strategy? But more importantly, do you feel it is ambitious enough in light of the unprecedented environmental and social challenges that we currently face? Uh, thanks, Nick. And thanks to the team, by the way, for an excellent presentation. Ambitious enough is a really interesting concept, I, I, I must admit. And um, as a non-executive director of Wilmore Dixon, so not just working with the team, but being very involved in what the company is doing at the moment, that has been top of our mind for the last 18 months. Because more than a year ago, we decided that for Wilmot Dixon to live up to our values, we needed to change the overall framing of our ambition to be the leader in sustainable construction, not just a leader. And there are lots of companies doing good things, not taking anything away from them. But for us, it doesn't really make any sense to be in a pack, even if that pack is good. We want to be the leader. So the deliberations that have been going on around this strategy have been intense. They've often been quite difficult. They are all stretching and they're deliberately stretching. And if they weren't, you would have every reason to be disappointed in what Wilmot Dixon is actually doing. Because I'm still mindful of that opening film where Sophie urged us to move away from the empty words. And my God, this is a scene that is still completely bulging with empty words from politicians. I look back over the last decade and all I see is a decade of complete underperformance, deregulation rather than better standard setting and working against the opportunities to make a better built environment a reality in everybody's lives. So we know we have to step up and do that. And these ambitions do seek to do that, really and truly, they do seek to do that. So we have action planning in each of these things. Embodied carbon is a really critical part of what we need to do. It may not sound ambitious that we're going to be able to deliver net zero embodied carbon buildings by 2040 but to get there we will have to make such incredible progress by 2030 that it really will begin to blaze a bit of a trail for the rest of the industry so on all of those points nick i would just simply say that we know what's afoot here we know what we need to do and i believe this is a company that is genuinely intent on doing it because of its resolute use of good science and it's absolutely solid values-based 
which allows all of these things to come alive inside the company. Thanks, Jonathan. And I think the emphasis on values and science and how that links to a bit to a, a company's business plan is a really interesting point to make and an important precedent, which applies not just for the construction sector, but actually many others uh, as well. Roger, I'd like to, to move to you uh, now. Um, I know that you and your team have delivered lots of best practice projects in your, in your region, but how do you and other managing directors feel about today's strategy? And do you feel you have the right tools to deliver it on the ground? Yeah, I think we do. I'm very, very pleased to have the clarity that this delivers for our ambition and our mission. I think it sets um, three key themes that are, are very easy to grasp hold of. And whilst the scale of the problem that we're facing um, is large, the way to deal with it is project by project, particularly with brilliant buildings. Um, the will is there. I think most of us, if not all of the planet, share the will. And the question I would ask is why not? Why wouldn't you want a building that's 80% um, less fuel consuming? Why wouldn't you want a building that's more comfortable to live in? Um, and the, the questions answered by that is, well, why don't we? What are the barriers? Um, I've, as you said, we've, we've delivered a, a, a few passive house projects now. Um, they're not as complicated as people want to make seem. They're just unusual and less run of the mill. It's just about making sure your envelope is built well. It's just about making sure you've got high levels of integrity in how you put the building together. And then it reduces the amount of burden on the planet. So the question for me is why not? I mean, it genuinely is why not? And having that experience, perhaps I was fearful as a leader of the business that maybe it would increase risk in my business. But having done it, I have to say to people that it's not a problem. Um, and I'm very passionate the fact that I don't think there's an increased cost in this either, not significant. Because whilst the envelope is a little bit more insulated, a little bit more carefully put together, the actual uh, M&E systems are less impactful. So um, I think the jury is out on why people think they don't want a brilliant building. And the question would be, let's get on with it. Thank you, Roger. And I'm glad you touched on the issue of cost because that's come up quite a few times in yeah. the Q&As that have come our way. And I'd like to touch on that again in a minute. Uh, Julia, being a chief sustainability officer of a company launching such an ambitious and comprehensive strategy, um, well, it's got to be quite an interesting position to be in. It's both obviously very exciting, but also quite challenging in the sense that you're now going to be overseeing the delivery of a very broad range of commitments. Um, do you feel that that's a strategy that can be delivered on the ground? And how do you uh, plan to engage with the rest of your sector so that other construction companies uh, follow your lead? Hi, Nick. Yes, um, big responsibility, but um, massive opportunity and a great privilege. Um, we said at the beginning of this journey two years ago that the journey to develop the strategy was as important as the destination, as the document with, with the targets itself. And so it has proven, as Mike referenced in the presentation, you know, we've spoken to a lot of people, both within the company, within our supply chain partners, our peers and competitors, our customers, um, and really try to understand what they want, uh, what's out there, what the, the possibilities are. And, you know, Jonathan and the rest of the board have tested and challenged us um, before they were prepared to sign up to it. So I know it's I'm not you know, I'm not leading this. So it's not my responsibility alone. Actually, it's it's all the leaders in our business have signed up from it for this. And that makes a massive difference because it's you know, there's a lot to do and there is only 10 years um, and we can't wait to start there is just so much to to get on with you know the next the next couple of years are really going to set that destination so um, we're very clear um, and people who know us will know that we don't set sort of lofty ambitions 10 years out without having some intermediate milestones and checks and balances in place so I will be being asked to report monthly to the to the board as to how we're doing and we will regularly review whether we're on track and if we're not why not and how we can correct that and but as, as Jonathan said it this is underpinned by the science I mean certainly our target uh, for carbon have now been approved by the Science-Based Target Initiative, which is um, a fantastic endorsement and, again, aligns us with other leaders in the sector. So 
Um, it's really important, I think, you know, we we enjoy working with our competitors and I'm, you know, I'd say I've probably got the best job in the company for that. You know, all of the uh, sustainability leads in all of our competitors and our, you know, supply chain parts of our, our customers, they want to learn, they want to collaborate because why wouldn't we, you know, we, we want to get on this journey faster. We want to, le to leave a planet fit for future generations. So um, we, we simply can't do it alone. So we do need to collaborate. And, you know, I'll put it out there. We've said it several times, you know, we do need like-minded customers, like-minded supply chain partners to actually turn these, these ambitions into reality. Thank you, Julia. And I guess it's worth flagging as well that your science-based targets are consistent with the more ambitious of the two goals in the Paris Agreement, so the 1.5 degree goal. And that's that's really important in terms of stretching what, what the strategy is uh, is about. Uh, we now uh, have a bit of time for Q&A. Now, uh, I have got 85 questions. And it's, I mean, it's, the, the number keeps changing roughly every um, five seconds. So uh, we're not going to be able to go through all of the um, now 86 questions, but I have been able to uh, go through most of them and group them in some key themes uh, but thank you to the audience in advance because I, I chair a lot of events and sometimes it's a really hard work to look for good questions and there are so many good questions today thank you so much for for taking the time to 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 send those and um, so the three key themes that have emerged um uh, at least for the first sort of 50 or so questions the first one is around how are you going to take uh, your supply chain on board with this? You know, how are you going to procure differently and engage with your supply chain differently so they can support you in your ambition? But just as importantly, and we touched on that during the presentation, how, what about your clients commissioning buildings? How are you going to get, going to get them, as Roger pointed out, to commission uh, brilliant buildings? Uh, so I'd love to hear your, your views on that. The second theme that's come up a lot is around the energy performance gap and really what are you how are you going to go about closing that performance gap and measuring your progress is that something that you can do internally or is that something that you're planning to invest in externally to, to help you get there and the third one uh jonathan will be pleased to hear is about policy now the one of the questions actually on policy came up first of all started with the the point around cost and was you know how do measures to cut carbon actually impact the overall cost of a building. And Roger sort of uh, slightly touched on this, uh, but to the extent that it does increase the upfront cost of the buildings, is the expectation that clients will just have to swallow up the costs or is it something that ultimately needs to be driven by better policy making and by regulation? Uh, there was a, a particularly good question on the uh, policy side uh, relating to this, making the point that you know, regulation is key and what can we do to accelerate um, regulations and government action to regulate for better building standards when if you look at the UK a lot of building standards have actually been diluted over the last 10 years so three key questions around supply chains and clients so how you bring them on board around how you're going to go about the energy performance gap and closing it and about the role of policy in delivering better buildings uh, if you're all able to give me some just sort of brief answers we might be able to fit in a couple of uh, extra questions afterwards but roger how about i start with you because you touched on the issue of cost in your uh, in your presentation yeah i think i think it's more perceived than real um i had that same perception before we got involved in building passive house um it seemed complicated it's out of the norm it was higher risk and so all those things not only for us but also our supply chain attracts additional costs um but as we got involved in the job we realized that it is a fairly straightforward uh, logistical challenge it's just a little bit unusual so i'm not convinced by this um uh, statement that it's more expensive. Um, comparing buildings of any type is very difficult, but I don't see the complexity in this model at all. Um, so I would still challenge that. I think, you know, you can, you can have your cake and eat it. And I think that's part of the work we've got to demonstrate going forward, that you're not going to have to put your hand in your pocket unduly for, for what basically is a far better product in a far better environment and our supply chain would share that strategy uh, as far as i'm concerned we've got good relationships with our supply chain but new ones will come on board that share our values so uh, for me if we can just push the barriers over together then we'll move this forward you know and that's what it's about it's about a will to move it uh, rather than just park it up and say can't do it because it's too expensive which has been probably the industry's response uh, so that's a bit of a challenge um, 
I think the performance gap, if you go with this mechanism, basically gets closed automatically because you build them with such um, accuracy, for want of a better term, and such, such quality focus that the performance gap absolutely is measurable because you're not building it to a minimum standard. Um, so that's probably the first bit of the answer for you. If you want to come back for more answer, I'll let someone else speak. Thank you, Roger. And, and I think the, the point you make around the perception of high cost associated mm. with good quality buildings is something that we are, uh, at Aldersgate regularly come across as a counter argument when, it, when interacting with the political world on, on building policy. So really interesting uh, point. Julia, do you want to sort of build on that point around the performance gap, but also um, how do you bring your, you know, your, your supply chain and, your, and your, your, your customers to want to deliver the buildings that you've been talking about today? Yes, the, support, the performance gap is probably the elephant in the room for uh, most of us in the construction sector. Um, it's that gap between what is designed and what you actually get in operation. It's something we've been talking about um, for a long time. And actually, uh, it's probably three and a half years ago now, we put in um, a strategy which we've termed energy synergy. And there's more about that in the, the strategy document where we actually commit to um, measure, monitor, monitor and measure against a detailed design and see where the building is not performing as designed and how to close that. And we've got um, 400 million pounds worth of projects currently running this methodology. And the brilliant thing about that is that we're able to learn from all of those projects and start building that learning back into the design of our buildings. The other interesting thing is that we sometimes find issues that are not necessarily to do with ourselves where there is uh, electrical equipment being left on that was, you know, nobody expected to happen. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's really important to be monitoring and measuring and verifying, as Alistair said, and we want this to become a standard offer. In fact, it's going to be applied on every project that we start from the beginning of next year um, to really start closing that gap and making sure we're, we're designing, well, we're delivering what we've designed. Um, in terms of, of customers and supply chain partners and taking them with us, um, we believe that our customers, you know, are, are, are alive to this as an opportunity and a need. You know, they're living in this changing world and this, this changing climate, and they want to have great buildings for their uh, for people to live and learn and work and, 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 and recover in. Um, so we're very much hoping that we will attract like minded customers who will be prepared to work with us and and, you know, specify those uh, fantastic buildings. Uh, it's really important, I think, to. Um, challenge perhaps that the, it's the old cost cost value capital cost op, opex uh, debate and we actually have just posted a uh, michael's posted a, a blog on that um they they're the words you know is it going to cost me more i don't want it because it's going to cost me more they're the words that send a shiver down a sustainability professional's spine um, and we need to start talking about value, not cost. And there was a, a very uh, useful report just been published by UK Green Building Council, which highlighted um, a couple of feasibility studies where it was, uh, I think, 3% for residential and 6% for, for commercial. I might have got those around the wrong way in terms of additional capital cost. But of course, that's not factoring in the added value in terms of a great building, but also negating the impact of then having to retrofit uh, for future climate change. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, where you draw the boundary of that, that uh, calculation is really important. And then in terms of our supply chain partners, you know, we've got um, a, a, a brilliant supply chain who work with us, um, who enjoy working with us, and um, I think are, are happy to come on that journey with us. We've got um, a number of uh, mandated supply chain partners, and we'll be working with them particularly hard in the beginning because you know somebody <laughs> rightly said it's it's about understanding the products so they need to help us understand where they've come from what's their embodied carbon content right from uh, you know when they were starting to be created how do we build those into our models how do we make sure that we are uh, evaluating them properly and I, I know some of the questions have come in about are we doing that internally or externally well probably a bit of both we've got some some new uh 
uh, programs that we're, we're using, but you know, we, we do work with uh, people who can do those calculations for us. And, you know, helping us tackle, you know, even something as basic as, as packaging and plastics and packaging, 30% of construction waste on our sites is plastics and packaging. That's got to be a quick win and one we all, I think, want to solve. So, um, yeah, uh, and just that, come I should say that's been, the, that's been the subject of many questions, actually, the extent to which you're going to try and drive down plastic pollution as well as all the other objectives on, on carbon. Uh, absolutely. It's a cost for us and it's a cost for our supply chain partners. So let's, let's innovate our way out of it. Thank you, uh, Julia. Jonathan, do you want to reflect in particular on the, on the policy point that was raised? Yes, I think it's fair to say that this strategy does not depend on an outbreak of progressive enlightenment on the part of policymakers in the UK. We will deliver against this strategy, notwithstanding the possibility, I only say that, of continuing mediocrity on the part of the political establishment. And I say that in those terms because, frankly, if you do look back over the last decade, we haven't seen any leadership here. The loss of the zero carbon agenda back in 2015 was a serious blow to the whole built environment sector here in the UK. So having said that, there are two things very quickly, Nick, that we know we have to focus on. The first is that we, as Julius just said, we want to create a coalition of interested parties to this kind of agenda. The construction industry is full of laggards, as well as full of leaders. And the only way that we can actually make sure that this becomes something resembling the norm in our industry is to be able to outperform those laggards and show what it is that we can deliver for clients in both the private and the public sector. And the second thing is we've got to expect that evidence-based policy, which has always been the norm, doesn't work quite so well these days as it might once have done. So for me, the trick is outcome-based policy. If we can show through outcomes, namely the brilliant buildings, the better lives, and a better planet for the future, we can show through outcomes, then policymakers, to be honest, really will respond to that more than they might from just a kind of advocacy driven uh, leadership proposition. So we have to do it, whatever we whatever else we know, we absolutely have to do it. And that's how we're going to drive that. Uh, it sounds a bit grumpy on my part. And let me reassure everybody, we talk to a lot of politicians, and almost all of my colleagues who talk to them are far more diplomatic than I am. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, uh, that was very, uh, very compelling. And uh, really, uh, for me, I would really encourage Wilma Dixon to sh proactively share this latest strategy with policymakers, because ultimately for government to move, we need enough good business examples to put in front of policymakers to, to, to see change. And I think what you've done today will really help with that. Uh, we've come to the end of uh, the time we had for Q&A sessions, but there have been an astonishing 115 questions submitted in the Q&A function, and they are very good quality questions. Um, so as I said at the beginning, we will respond to all questions in uh, writing. So uh, we will, we are really interested in, 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 in the views you've expressed today, and we really want to, to do them justice. Um, so uh, really just a, a, as a brief wrap up and reflection from, from what we've heard today, I think a, a key point that really strikes me today is just how important it is for the construction sector to have ambitious sustainability strategies. One thing that Rick Wilmot said in his opening film that really resonated with me is that uh, the construction industry is ultimately a high impact sector. And I think those words of high impact are, are really uh, powerful. Uh, the construction and operation of buildings represents roughly 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions. But we also know, especially now in a post COVID um, uh, context, that the construction industry also has a very important role to play in being able to offer rewarding careers to young people who have been disproportionately impacted by um, the uh, unemployment crisis that we've seen as a result of, uh, of the pandemic and the, the lockdown measures that, that came with it. So I really think that when, when you take those, those social and environmental imperatives in mind, Wilmot Dixon has really risen to the uh, challenge today and sent a very important market signal on its sustainability commitment.
Now, I just hope that others in the construction industry can follow suit. And I know there are other, lots of extremely good, positive players in the sector who want to do the same or are trying to do their version of the same. And I would encourage you to, to, to keep at it. But I also really hope that today's strategy will send a strong signal to policymakers. I think ultimately it's a strong reminder that if we want... Uh, our, our buildings to be in a better place. We need policymakers to really make a decisive shift in introducing mandatory uh, low carbon and energy efficiency requirements for new and existing buildings, but also taking care to ensure that those buildings are much better uh, able to cope with the overheating risks of flooding and other risks that climate change is throwing at us. And I should say that um, on the on the 5th of October, um, we at the Aldersgate Group will be launching a, a report and having a, a launch webinar at 12 o'clock uh, on our latest report called Building a Net Zero Emissions Economy, where we will be providing a sector by sector perspective of all the key policy measures that businesses think need to be taken in this parliamentary term to put the UK on track for net zero emissions. And Wilmot Dixon have been a great contributor to that report. Uh, and we make numerous recommendations uh, on, uh, on buildings. So do try and join us for that uh, if you can. Now, I'd like to thank our very engaging panel, Jonathan, Julia and Roger for all their comments today and are having to deal with lots of questions on the spot. So that's much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to the group sustainability team for a very engaging presentation and doing these things always requires a lot of prep but having to do them on zoom it takes double the amount of prep so well done to all of you because it was really well coordinated and and very uh, very clear and of course thank you to Wilmot Dixon's group chief executive Rick Wilmot for a very engaging film at the start of the event uh, as well. Uh, so for the benefit of our audience, you are going to receive an email following the event. But the email will contain a link that will take you straight to the Now or Never strategy website. On that website, you'll have access to all the materials that have been uh, discussed today. Uh, you will be also able to ask uh, further questions or provide feedback on the strategy and today's event, and we would love to hear your feedback. And that is also the place where uh, Wilmot Dixon colleagues will be responding to all the questions you've asked today. So keep an eye out for that website. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for uh, taking part in today's event, for attending today's events, and really a special thank you to all of, all those of you in the audience who have really been, um, who have really shown a lot of interest in what was being discussed today, both through your questions and the comments that you've made. It's much appreciated, and uh, I'd like to wish you all a nice day, and thank you again for, for coming today. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.